and thank you for coming to the seminar uh, this afternoon. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Gary, aka Pete Peterson, who is uh, here with us today. Dr. Peterson is Emeritus Professor at Colorado State University, um, grew up on a small irrigated farm in uh, South Central Nebraska. He got his education, his bachelor's uh, of science in 1963 at the University of Nebraska in agronomy. His MS also in, at the University of Nebraska with Robert Olson. And his PhD in 1967 here at Iowa State University working with our own John Pesek. So he's come full circle and uh, is, is here uh, back on the grounds that John Pesek once commanded. <laughs> um, his career, he was a professor at uh, University of Nebraska from 1967 to 1984. And after that, he moved to Colorado State University um, and uh, became the head of the department at Colorado State University in 2003 to 2011. Uh, he taught uh, soil and crop management. Um, he has many honors, and some of these include being a fellow in the Soil Science Society of America, American Society of Agronomy, uh, American Association for Advancement of Science, and, and the Soil and Water Conservation Society. He's past president of the Soil Science Society of America. He holds distinguished service awards in both ASA and SSSA. Um, he has multiple teaching and research awards. He served as associate editor for Agronomy Journal and as editor-in-chief for the American Society of Agronomy. I'm sure he's most proud of the 22 masters and 18 PhD students that he has mentioned. He's authored uh, well over 100 refereed publications. And today he's here to speak with us about uh, Managing precipitation use efficiency in dryland systems to enhance productivity and sustainability. Peterson. Thank you, David. <clears throat> it's a real privilege to be here. I'm was self-invited. My grandson is at Iowa State. He's up front here, and uh, I asked if I could come and give a seminar, and they said yes, and I'm happy about that and then they gave me a free lunch and a nice visit so this is really cool so I'm going to talk about this uh, subject today and uh, I just want to what would I do um, this is how this building looked when I came here and all it was was uh, one little piece of what you have today anyways long time ago so now today I'm going to uh, talk about the Great Plains and the sustainability issues and so we're going to uh, identify the ecosystem characteristics we're going to explore the sustainability problem and the fragile nature of that ecosystem we'll discuss some research findings and then we'll try to derive some principles that you could take well maybe you won't take but somebody else could take someplace else so um, I, I always make some assumptions and I just assume students don't know anything before I start so I'm assuming today that you need a reminder. And so I want to talk about uh, how this place I'm going to talk about the research differs from where we are today in Ames, Iowa. So there, there's the precip and temperature distribution for the typical Great Plains. And uh, here's Ames, Iowa. Now you say they look a lot alike. But what I want you to look at is the uh, y-axis of the typical Great Plains, and you notice it goes from 0 to 80 millimeters annual per, or per month. And then if you look at the one here for Ames, it goes from 0 to 140. So there are a few differences there. The distributions are very similar. Okay, so now the part that uh, even the farmers forget when they talk to each other is the evaporation component of this whole equation. So the challenge is the evaporation exceeds precipitation. And so to illustrate this, I'm going to use data from open pan evaporation. And this is not a very popular thing to measure anymore because it's too much work. Each day you have to go out and measure how much water has been lost from this free surface. 
So here are some Iowa locations. And uh, obviously, where you have winter and frost, you don't collect evaporation data except for the growing season. So these are numbers now. This is the amount of water from a free surface that evaporates from May to October. And you can see the numbers there, ranges from 930 to 1074. The annual precip at those sites ranges from 716 to 955. Now, these are some locations in Colorado. And uh, you can look at the numbers. They range from 1524 to 1620. And the average annual precip is 305 to 457. So the mean of those, of the precip in those Iowa sites is 882. The mean for Colorado sites is 586. And so then we'll calculate the deficit, minus 132. And then we'll calculate the deficit for the Great Plains in Colorado, minus 967. So I'm just going to put some circles around those because this is the difference. This is the big difference. So what we're dealing with is an environment where when a drop of water falls, your largest enemy is the dry air. <clears throat> On a personal basis, when you move from Ames, Iowa to Fort Collins, you start buying lotion for your skin. You never have to worry about it here. You know, you stay hydrated. OK, so now um, we have the precip and evaporation differences. And so dry land farming areas have huge water deficits relative to rain-fed farm regions. Iowa is rain-fed. I know you have a little irrigation, but I know an Iowa farmer might say I'm a dry lander just because they don't irrigate. But actually, they have a lot of water. You even have tile drainage. OK, so now, another thing about the ecosystem. Uh, even Iowa probably had this, but the big deal is that before the settlers came to start growing cultivated crops. You had land cover 100% of the time, unless the buffalo happened to come in and tear it all up for a few minutes. All right. So then along comes uh, civilization, people. And so uh, in 1879, 10 million acres had been plowed. 50 years later, when the steam tractors came, 100 million acres had been plowed. And so what happened was we had huge carbon oxidation. So now we've taken this fragile e ecosystem where, you know, there's a lot of evaporation, it's hard to grow something, and we've now also stopped putting as much carbon in and we've oxidized a, a whole bunch of the carbon that we have. So here's a typical curve. You can find this in every textbook you lose carbon. Now, the thing that's different about this graph than an Iowa graph, your x-axis might start at 8 or 10% in Iowa. And we, if we're lucky, we could find one that's at 2.5% of the native condition. So the cultivation has uh, helped us lose carbon. So now, we've got a, an environment then that people fail to understand. So most of you have heard about the fact there's been a thing called the Dust Bowl. And the Dust Bowl occurred because people didn't understand the ecosystem they were in. That's the basic reason. So hopefully we understand it well enough today that we won't have another Dust Bowl. All right, so now let's have a little historical perspective here. The Great Plains has the dry land part now has been farmed mostly as a wheat fallow system. And uh, today, even in the US, there's over 15 million acres of fallow, meaning no crop being grown. So just in case you uh, don't understand what this means, <clears throat> I'm going to beat you up a little bit with this. In a wheat fallow system, in a winter wheat fallow system, you have about 10 months of crop and 14 months of no crop, all right? And so most of that time, you're trying to kill the weeds in the fallow. So how do you do that? Well, you till it. A typical thing would be to till five to seven times during the 14 months. And you end up then with surfaces like that, kind of look like a pool table, you know, nice and smooth, and absolutely no residue. Okay, so a little more. Got to beat you up a little more because you really need to understand 
how bad wheat fallow really is. That's the message. So there's one crop in every two-year period. And let's just go right down. I think I have a laser pointer here, right? Yeah. Let's go right down to this graph. So for 10 months, you've got your winter wheat. You plant it in the fall. You harvest it the following July. And then for 14 months, no crop. You're killing weeds. You're keeping it bare. Then you plant crop again. 10 months, 14 months fallow. And this goes on for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Now, in addition to the fact that it's bare, if you compare the amount of carbon return to the soil in a wheat fallow system compared to the old native grasses that were there, you're putting in much less carbon, much less. In fact, you're only putting carbon in once every two years. That's it. So we're tilling, we're oxidizing carbon, and we're not putting very much back. So what's going to happen to the carbon supply? It's going to drop. What's going to happen to the already weak soil structure that we have? It's going to get weaker. And then when a raindrop hits on that bare soil, puddling, drying, crusting, low infiltration, and the system's in a general spiral down. I hope I've painted a bad picture for you, right? That's the whole idea here. OK, so now. Um, this always surprises people the first time. It's maybe not your first time, so it won't surprise you. In that 14-month period of time, if you're really lucky, you'll save 25% of the water that fell out of the sky. That's like putting a dollar in the bank and drawing out 25 cents. You wouldn't keep your money in that bank very long, right? Whoops, I'm just really good at that. And then you've got this bare soil. And then, uh, most people don't think about this, wheat fallow is actually a monoculture. So every winter annual grassy weed that you can think of mimics the wheat. There's a thing called jointed goat grass, downy brome, they go, the list goes on. So the longer you practice wheat fallow, the more problems you have with that. And of course, then we've got the large losses of carbon. So it's a really bad system. Okay, so uh, back in 1984-85, we, uh, we, me, Dwayne Westfall, and myself, started thinking about what we could do to try to um, address this issue. Now, it was known at the time that some people were growing other crops and not doing wheat fallow. They were doing like wheat sorghum fallow, wheat corn fallow, stuff like that. But it was just kind of sporadic. Nothing much was happening. So we tried to uh, figure out how we were going to address this issue of maximizing our precipitation use. We wanted every bit of production we could get out of every unit of water. We wanted to improve that soil. We'd like to put more carbon back. We'd like to stabilize aggregates. And then we'd like to make more money. Now, my experience is you can tell a farmer all about wonderful things they can do to improve their farm. But if it doesn't make money, you're just wasting your time. So it had to make money. So this is the experiment. Now I want you to focus up on the upper left here. And uh, the experiment has a climate variable. Well, I guess I can do this. Anyway, you can see a climate variable, a soil variable, a cropping system variable, and then the one in the oblong thing, the time. Now, Dwayne and I were thinking, if we're going to start this experiment, if we can't do this for 15 to 20 years, we're wasting our time. So the challenge was, how are we going to keep this going? And I'm not going to talk about that part of it today. That's a different story. So the climate variable, what is that? Well, in eastern Colorado, we have an evaporation gradient. And again, using the open pan. So for example, in northeastern Colorado, about 1,600 millimeters we get down here to southeastern Colorado, 1975. A huge difference, meaning that for every um, piece of leaf area you have or bare soil, whatever, the potential to evaporate water is changing over time, over space, excuse me. And then we have a soil variable, and I'm going to focus on that one. We, we went out to uh, the uh, eastern Colorado, and we picked three sites along that 
gradient of, of uh, evaporation that had three different kinds of soils. So we wanted a summit, which was relatively level, a slope where water would run off, and then what we'd call the good soil, the catch, catch position, which is the toe slope. So in each experiment then, in each climate, we would collect soil, uh, excuse me, collect data by soil, like yield, soil water, soil organic carbon, and various physical properties, and so forth. And then imposed across the soils at each of the locations, we have these cropping systems. We have wheat fallow, that's a two-year system. We have wheat corn fallow, and by the way, in southeastern Colorado, grain sorghum is a better alternative than corn. So at that site, it was green sorghum, not corn. Then we have wheat, corn, proso millet. And proso millet is a open panicle uh, kind of uh, great dryland crop. It's just not worth much money. It's a super crop, not worth much money. And then uh, this is the fun one. We said, let's try to be opportunists and try to grow a crop every year. And so what are we going to do? Well, sometimes we're going to put a forage in there. Sometimes we're going to have to fallow it if it's too dry, but we're just going to be opportunity. And at the same time, we said, uh, how are these systems going to compare to grasses to put carbon back into the soil? Now, everybody knows that perennial grasses are going to put more carbon in, We've got the root system and all this. So we put in a mixture of grasses in the perennial grass that would be uh, mostly native species. And then the idea was that after time, we can see how much carbon we're putting back with our cropping systems compared to the best system, which would be the grass. So this is the experiment, th just an example. We use no-till planting, no cultivation, and herbicidal weed control. Now, uh, we made one important decision with the herbicides. There's always a way to control a weed with some fancy herbicide. But remember, we're looking at economics. And so we decided we weren't going to choose any herbicide program that we didn't think was feasible for an ordinary farmer. That meant that we're not going to have very good control of field sandbar. Now, field sandbar is a nasty weed out there. And all of the chemical controls for that are expensive. Dryland farmer couldn't possibly use them. So we tried to choose a program that would be uh, something a farmer could use. So what did we learn? Now, before I uh, talk about this graph, I've got to explain something, and it's called annualization. When you've got a two-year, three-year, and four-year rotation, and you've got a fallow in there, how are you going to calculate? How are you going to compare? So what you see here for the two-year is the wheat fallow, and we take the wheat yield and divide by two. So this is production per year. In the case of the three year, let's say wheat corn fallow, you add up the wheat yield and the corn yield, and you divide by three, because it took three years to grow those two crops. Same thing with the four year, take the wheat, the corn, and the millet, add them up, divide by four, to get them on a comparable basis. So now, what you see in this graph is that going from the two-year to the three-year gave us a 75% increase in annualized grain yield. That was pretty neat. But here's the part that was maybe even better. There was no interaction between the climate and the soil in this relative increase. So here's what we're saying. You don't get the same size increase at the driest place, you get a relative increase. So down at Walsh, Colorado, and by the way, they tell a joke down at Walsh, Colorado, there was this farmer down there that got sent to jail for child abuse. And the reason was he left the farm to his son. That's the kind of place it is, okay? So uh, even there, switching the rotation from wheat fallow to the more intensive increased the yield relatively uh, that much, all right? So then uh, you notice that the continuous cropping is not on this graph because if you've got a continuous crop and you've got forage in there, how are you going to put forage together with grain crops? 
So we did that by looking at the total above ground biomass. So in this graph, the two year represents the grain and straw production divided by two, it's annualized and so forth. And then the continuous crop is the, the total above ground biomass, including the forage. And you'll notice that uh, from the two year to the continuous there, there's about a 90% increase in biomass. And again, uh, this is, uh, uh, was independent of climate and slope position. All right, so what have we learned so far? Well, we've got increased grain yield, increased profits, by the way, I haven't said much, won't say too much about that, 30, 45%, decreased erosion potential. We're keeping cover on the land all the time. And we've got increased carbon inputs. So here's the question, and by the way, the puzzle pieces there will not fit together. <laughs> that was on purpose. Because putting this together isn't this, you know, you got a piece here and a piece there. Anyway, so here's the deal. We didn't get any more water. So how in the world could we get a 75% increase in grain yield and a 90% increase in biomass? What can we learn from these data that we can use someplace else? That's really why we started. That's what we wanted to know. Okay, so now, uh, before I show you this, it's good to run into smart people. And we had a cooperator with ARS, his name is Dr. Hamid Farahani. He was a postdoc with ARS, and he was interested in our data set. He has a degree in agricultural engineering, and he's just a flat out smart guy. So he took this data and he started taking it apart. And we're gonna take the summer fallow period. You remember what that is? That's that 14 months that we don't have any crop. We're gonna break it down into parts. And so we've got something here called stage one and it lasts two and a half months. It's the, uh, it's the period of time after you harvest your wheat crop until September, all right? Roughly two and a half months. And during this period of time, We've got high air temperatures, and we've got a dry soil surface because the wheat has exhausted the water supply before harvest. Our data showed that over the years, we could save 10 to 35% of the precip that fell during that period. You say, wow, that's not very much. Well, it's something, right? You say, why does it vary so much? Why 10 to 35? Well, if you haven't been in Eastern Colorado in the summer, you need to understand that sometimes the rain comes down in buckets. You'll get a large amount of water in five minutes and it doesn't matter what kind of surface you have, you get runoff. The other thing is sometimes you'll get a shower of rain, the sun will come out, the wind will pick up and your evaporation takes the water before it can even infiltrate. So it's no wonder that this is so um, variable. Okay, stage two, this is from September until the following May. And uh, this is seven and a half month period. And here we have low air temperatures. We have a soil surface that's at field capacity because we've stored enough water in stage one that we have at least some of the reservoir filling. And then we have a dry soil profile below. There's a place to go with additional water. Look at that. 50 to 80 percent. Now our winters are dry. January, February, we don't get much water. But March is our big month for snow that comes half snow and half rain. The soil is not frozen and uh, you can store this water. Also, have you ever thought about the impact of a snowflake compared to the impact of a raindrop? You think about that. We don't get any splash, we just get infiltration. So here comes stage three. Now stage three starts in May and let's say uh, normal wheat fallow. Now we're in no-till so we aren't tilling here but it's four and a half months from May to September. And now we have high air temperatures. They're exactly like the high air temperatures that we had back in stage one. But now we've got a wet profile. 
Now, it's not the same degree of wetness every year, obviously, but the surface is wet and we've stored as much as we can in those first two periods. And so we've got um, pretty good water content. This is what our data show. You can basically say that over that period of time from May to September that we didn't store any water. Now, in a typical wheat fallow, it's even worse because the farmer's tilling. So if we couldn't store any water with no till, what's going to happen if you're doing tillage? Well, you can figure that out, right? So when, I, when my uh, uh, compadre, Dwayne Westfall, saw my numbers, he says, you're wrong. You did something wrong. It's impossible that you didn't store any water. So he took all the numbers and he looked at them and he said, no, we didn't store any water there. We really didn't. So um, Hamid then took this kind of stuff and he said, uh, well, what's going on here? So now, um, on the left side, we have the two-year, three-year, and four-year rotations. And in the next two columns, we have the time in crop and the time in fallow. So what we didn't do by going from two to three to four-year rotations, we didn't change the amount of time in crop or the amount of time in fallow. Because automatically, some people would say, well, when you go from wheat fallow to wheat corn and millet fallow, you must have changed how much fallow time you have. Well, you can see there that basically not much difference. So this is where Hami's work really popped in. He started looking at how much of that fallow time was in stage one, stage two, and stage three. Now, you remember that stage one, we stored a little bit of water. Remember in stage two, that's a really good water storage period. You remember stage three, it's in red on purpose, is a really rotten time to store water. So what, what has happened as we've gone from wheat fallow to wheat corn mill fallow, we've actually decreased the amount of time in the part of the year that's hard to store water, basically nothing. And we've increased the amount of time where it's easier to store water. That's the difference. Now, there's one more thing we need to look at. We want to look at when are we getting our precip relative to these different stages. So we've got the two-year, three-year, and four-year. And I took stages one and two and put them together. So uh, to understand what we're doing here, we're saying that uh, how much of the rainfall Let's take the four-year one. We've got four years of rainfall here. How much of that rain is falling during stages one and two compared to stage three? So you can see that from two year, three year, four year, there's really not a lot of difference there. But look at this. What we've done is we have replaced time in stage three, or the precept that falls here, with having a crop in the field when the water is falling. Now I'm going to uh, play with your mind a little bit here. Maybe you've never done this. But if you go out to a prairie and uh, you put some water on it, something always greens up right away and uses that water. You know, these native ecosystems, there's a plant there to use the water when it falls. Okay, so what we've done here, we've taken our rotation and we've shifted so that we have more crop in the field when the water's falling. Now this is really important because if you've got a crop in the field, it provides canopy for one thing. So you change the impact, the water can, if you do get rain, can run down and you can get infiltration. And instead of the water being there very long to evaporate, You've got a plant to use it, a useful plant, not a weed, okay? So uh, this, um, this explains why, the previous uh, graph in this one, explains why going from two year to three year to four year allows us to produce more biomass per unit of water. It's not a matter of less fallow, it's a matter of 
when you have the foul. Now, all of these uh, things are written up in advances in agronomy, and uh, if you want to know more, you can uh, have a look at that. All right. Now, our other uh, objective was to see what would happen to soil properties as we had more crop. <clears throat> so here's, uh, here's what happened to carbon after 12 years. Now you notice I don't have any statistics on this graph because it's really difficult to detect changes in organic carbon. Now I'm going to tell you a little story here. How much time do I have? Am I all right on time? Oh yeah. Okay. So I have a lot of farmers that will come up to me and they'll say, you know, I, I switched to no-till. My organic carbon has increased 20% from where it was. I said, well, really? Well, I've been doing this for 12, 15 years out here, and I can barely detect a carbon change. So here's what farmers do, and I'm not blaming them. They gather up a sample, and they send it to a lab, and the lab doesn't do a good job of sorting the residue out of the soil. Now, you all know how carbon analysis is done, right? You put it in a leco and you burn it. If there's any piece of residue in your sample, you're going to get a goofy number. And a lot of people that are looking at what happens when they put their systems in, they're not doing a very good job of uh, the sampling. Anyway, just a little side note. So what's happened here is there's been an, a slight increase in carbon, but it's mostly, if you look at the little red bars, the, the carbon change has come mostly in that top two and a half centimeters. And that's really a good place for it to happen because that has caused a change in porosity. Now this is effective porosity. This is the porosity at field capacity, all right? So going from wheat fallow, 24%, 29% with uh, the continuous crop. And this paper is by uh, Tim Shaver, all right? So what's the significance here? By increasing the porosity, what we're now prepared to do is take a drop of water and get it into the soil as quickly as we can. And I'm going to say this again. We want it to get into the soil as quickly as we can because we have a high temperature, dry atmosphere. And the moment you can get that water to go into the surface soil a millimeter, you change the capture from something to more, right? So getting water in quickly is a big deal. So the improved carbon has led to a decreased surface bulk density. Our surface two and a half centimeter densities are down. And if you go out there and look at them, it's obvious to see why. There's a lot of residue pieces. Some of them are partially decomposed. I call it like in a forest soil, you have the duff, you know, the kind of half residue, half mineral. You have that occurring right at the very surface. And so we've also gotten improved aggregation in that surface and more stable aggregates. And that's led to this in effective porosity. Now, this is a small change, but in the long term, this is one that's really going to pay off. So what we need in these systems is to first have a crop out there to use the water but we also need to get the water into the soil as quickly as possible. Okay, so in conclusion here, we've got increased productivity, we've increased net income, and by the way, uh, you know, I'm one of these back of the envelope economists. You know what that is? You take a piece of paper and you, so instead of doing it that way, we actually got somebody from the you know, the real economists to do this, and they calculated the cost of the pickup and, you know, everything that the farmer has. And lo and behold, this is the kind of increase we've had. We've increased precipitation use efficiently. We've improved soil physical conditions and increased precipitation capture, and we've decreased erosion potential. And that last one, I don't have a measure for that. I just look at what I have out there in terms of a, a cover and uh, the dust doesn't blow, and the water doesn't carry soil off the field when it rains. 
and we've got improved overall productivity. Now, um, there's roughly 15, one and a half million acres in Colorado converted from wheat fallow to some kind of a three-year system. And when I say some kind of a three-year system, I mean some people are growing wheat corn fallow. Some people are growing wheat sunflower fallow. Some people are growing wheat millet fallow. And you can fill in the blank. So they're doing something other than wheat fallow in this conversion. And so uh, I should have just said $15 per acre, but the economist said it was $14.85, so I'll leave it there. And so then if you've converted one and a half million acres, that represents a lot of money per year. And that's just in one state. So the regional impact is even better. And then we've got this. All right. So now, we've got plenty of time for questions. And uh, I might not have the answers, but if I don't know, I'll just tell you. Any questions? Yes, sir. So why, based on your results, why aren't more farmers adopting the four-year or every year crop? What's your this is a really hard question. And uh, I think it's cultural, uh, for one thing. Uh, dryland farmers are risk adverse and they know something's been working and sometimes government programs have made it more feasible to just stay the way you were and so that's part of it. The other part was expressed to me by a gentleman whose son had graduated from CSU and was back home farming and they converted these systems and he says you know now that my son is home I'm working a lot harder I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm spraying, I'm planting, I'm hauling, I'm changing the combine head. So in other words, all of a sudden, there's a lot more management involved and they're reading herbicide labels and they're making decisions and there's some people that just aren't ready to make those kind of switches. So I don't have any other <laughs> really good reasons, but it just seems to me that uh, it's just going to take a bunch of time before people really do this. We have another thing coming up. Just a minute, David. Another thing coming up. We have uh, Roundup resistant kochia. And Roundup has been a key chemical in these systems. And uh, those resistant weed issues are not trivial. I'll just say that. Right. So given the, the possibility and given the... Um, fact that the two-year wheat fallow system really isn't saving you any water, mm -hmm. why did it develop in the first place? Can you give us a historical context? Yep. So uh, if you're out here and you're trying to make a living and you want to have enough beans to live from one year to the next, with wheat fallow, the chances of growing some crop versus, like, if you're in continuous wheat, you can have a year when you don't grow anything. So by going with wheat fallow and storing that little bit of extra water, you reduce your risk of total crop failure. Now there's an interesting old set of data from North Platte, Nebraska, where they had this experiment of wheat fallow and continuous wheat for 30 years. The total number of bushels of wheat produced for the two systems is basically identical. But in the continuous wheat, there's some years when there's zero yield. And then the next year will be a big one. And so I think it's just people are trying to avoid not having something. So it's just risk avoidance. Now, I didn't tell you the whole story about the, the fallow efficiency business. If you're in North Dakota, where you have lower evaporation, you can actually store more like 30% of the precip. But if you're in Texas, I don't know if anybody knows where Bushland, Texas is, but there's a famous ARS station there. You get 12 to 15 percent storage. So the, the fallow system is even worse in Texas than it is in North Dakota. So I can't give you any better explanation, I don't think. Yes? Does uh, changing crop genetics, maybe uh, 
water stress resistance play a role in why that's working now and maybe would that have previously? I'm glad you brought that up because I think that there's a big part there, especially with corn. When I was a kid in central Nebraska, if we grew 100 bushel per acre irrigated corn, we were ecstatic. I've grown 100 bushel dry land corn in eastern Colorado, and it's all about genetics because those varieties are much more adapted to stress. And so that's, that's a big part of it too, no doubt. Yeah, Bob. I know some of these old timers from Texas. I don't know if you know these gentlemen, Charles Went. Do you know him at all? No, I do not. I love it, Texas. And uh, Paul Unger. I know Paul. From Bushland, Texas. Yeah. But they, they did lots of research on, you, know, you, you define the fallow where there's a lot of cultivation or, or tillage going on, but they, they used mulches. Mm -hmm. They didn't have bare surfaces. Mm -hmm. Does that, do you know, have you done studies in Colorado, does that make a difference on efficiency of water storage during those periods? It does, uh, and we, most farmers now are, if they're still tilling, they're using stubble mulch where they leave some residue. But the thing that compounds that is that when, you, um, when you're not using chemicals for weed control, you still need to stir the soil. So even though you've got some mulch on top, you cause some water evaporation with your, with your tillage. You always bring some moist soil to the surface. And so those systems are better than bare fallow, but they're nowhere near as good as these ones where you don't till at all. Yep. You can never have enough residue either. Uh, you know, you, the amount of residue you have is limited by the precip you have. And the further south you go, the less residue you have. It's just a, a big issue. Yes, sir. Is the climate changing? Like the precipitation patterns in Iowa when you were here are different now than back then. Yeah. Is that happening in Colorado? Yeah, but it's uh, not the pattern as much as the weirdness of it all. You'll have just a strange storm. You'll have extended heat or something like that. And so I don't know if you could measure a pattern change, but the uh, uh, variability is greater. And it was so always bad. Storage even more important. More important, right. What I'd like to see is being able to use every drop of water the minute it falls. You know, that would be the best way. Yes, sir. Your observation that it's hard to measure changes in organic matter uh, over extended periods uh, makes me wonder if we're really using the best method to measure organic matter changes. Our standard procedure is, as, as you said, to collect a sample and pick out all the visible residues and then call what remains soil organic matter. But then, as you pointed out, those residues have a pretty important impact mm -hmm. on the uh, water volume capacity and porosity in the soil. Mm -hmm. Why are we picking out the most important thing when it might have an important impact? Yeah, I, I would rather know the bulk density of the surface than the organic carbon content. But you realize that's also a very changeable number. And if it's ha somebody happens to walk someplace, it changes it. But the bulk density and the porosity are, for, for dryland systems, when we're trying to capture water, that's a more important thing to know than the carbon content. So I don't, I don't know what to do about it, but I'd agree that that little bit of uh, stuff that's undecomposed material is really important. Uh, I've got a student, uh, Rodrigo Ortega, who did an experiment where he went out and he measured how much actual uh, identifiable residue was in the top two and a half centimeters of soil and so forth. And there's a huge amount of residue in our, in our surface that's changing that bulk density. That uh, you know, it's a very significant thing. And carbon alone won't, won't tell you what that is. Yes? Um, so I think that companies like Monsanto have uh, genetically modified corn uh -huh. uh, for drought tolerance, mm -hmm. for high water use efficiency. Have you tested those within your systems? I have not. And some of the people that are operating this experiment now are probably going to do that. Okay. But I haven't had the opportunity. I've been retired too long. Okay. 
Um, in the northern Great Plains, one of the successes at replacing fallow has been the incorporation of uh, short season grain legumes, mm -hmm. dry pea and level predominantly. Where is the research now in the central plains on, on the grain legumes? Most of the time it hasn't been very successful yet. I know one uh, farm in western Nebraska that has been growing field pea and they found a good market for it and they, they've they had some good success. That would be a wonderful thing to be able to put into it. Um, in general, forages are really an important part of these systems. I'm not saying this for just Ken here, but uh, forages are important. We have a lot of farmers in eastern Colorado that have both cattle and crops, so it'll work. We have a lot more who don't have cattle. Cattle are work. You can't go to Arizona in the winter if you have cattle. And so they don't want forages in their system. But it's the ideal way to decrease hail risk. It's the ideal way to keep the soil covered. And it has a lot of good components. Now the cover crop business, uh, we've been fighting a battle in eastern Colorado. You know, water is everything to us. So drop of water is a dollar gained or a dollar lost. And if you grow a cover crop just for cover, you're giving up some water that could have been maybe used for something that would create a dollar for you. So what we prefer, instead of cover crops, is some kind of a forage that people could actually use for their cattle. So there's a lot of semantics here. Do you grow cover crops? Oh yeah. Well, are you letting your cattle graze them or are you haying them? Oh yeah. Well, that's not a cover crop. <laughs> that's a forage. So, you know, we have a lot of that going on. We've had a lot of battles with NRCS about, you know, cover crops in Colorado, uh, because if you're just gonna grow a cover crop, you're gonna spend the money to plant it and then you're not going to get anything back from it. Yeah, that's a little iffy. That that's caused a lot of static. Yeah. Uh, have you looked at the nitrogen use efficiency in these different three, four systems you have? Yeah, we've had some students that have done that, and uh, you. This is a really you pick up all the nitrogen. If you if you have a low crop one year, you know we don't get much leaching, so your next year's crop will will pick it back up. So they're, they're very efficient in scavenging the nitrogen. And Robert Kohlberg did some of that work for us. Yes, back row. I'm curious about this opportunity, especially in light of your productivity results that uh -huh. are So you have this continuous growth of some crop plants. Right. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about that and yep. tease out what's going on now? Yeah, so uh, when we were doing that opportunity cropping, we decided that we would make the decision on what to plant based on what we thought we could make the most money with. And so that means having wheat and corn or sorghum as often as we can. The forage crop, uh, the kind of forages we grow are what a farmer would call uh, crap hay. You know, they're low quality, low protein, filler kind of things. So those are stopgap. So we tried to grow corn and wheat in that system as often as we could. But you need a forage every now and then to interrupt. So uh, out of the first 12 years, I think uh, there were probably three years of forage and nine years of crops in those. Uh, one other thing, one time we thought when we started, we were gonna be able to identify whether we should plant, oh, it's five o'clock, excuse me. Uh, we were gonna say by having this much soil water in spring, that would determine whether we planted corn or not. We found out that the amount of water planting wasn't what decided what your corn yield was gonna be. It's the amount of rainfall that you get from July 15th to August 30th. And since you can't predict that, <laughs> we had years when we had very small amount of subsoil water in the spring. We got really good wheat yields, or excuse me, good corn yields just because it rained at the right time. So I've got one more slide, David, and then I'll okay. let you go. Uh, I wanna thank uh, all of you for coming today. And these two fellows, uh, Bob Olson got me into uh, soils. He's the uh, father of my profession. And his buddy, John Pesek, was absorbing some of his master's students. So uh, David Whitney 
and Ken Frank and me and I don't know who else, maybe Raleigh Meyer, a bunch of people came from Olson to Pesic and he finished us off. So uh, thanks to both those guys. That's it. Well, thank you.